that uh, President Obama's uh, inaugural address was regarded by some uh, columnists and commentators as less than the uh, the uh, exaggerated uh, levels that uh, they had uh, expected, but their expectations were perhaps uh, excessive. I thought that his speech made several trailblazing important substantive points including a paragraph addressed to members of the Islamic faith, including a sentence addressed to those who despise us in Iran, including a number of points demonstrating the turns that are going to be made in American policy. And while soaring rhetoric is fine and beautiful and uh, thrilling, the substantive points are far, far more important. Think about the best inaugurals over the, uh, the decades of American history. Thomas Jefferson's first, Abraham Lincoln's second, which is the best of all time. His first was also good. Franklin D. Roosevelt's first. His second wasn't bad either. And uh, I would like to say that uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, inaugural uh, has often been uh, ranked among those uh, best uh, as well. An inaugural is not an easy speech. I had the unfortunate assignment when uh, working on John F. Kennedy's. He wanted me to read all the inaugurals, at least all those in the 20th century, and it was a pretty miserable lot. <laughs> I can tell you, more uh, pomposity than, uh, than uh, values uh, that uh, were meaningful in any way. But it's difficult to, uh, to write at an inaugural speech. It's supposed to be nonpartisan. And it's been given by a man who has been nothing but partisan for the uh, year or two uh, preceding that occasion. It is supposed to look abroad as well as at home at an occasion when the problems at home necessarily require priority attention. I suppose that to a president, and I make no apologies for the fact that uh, presidents don't write their own speeches. They're busy men. And I'm not restricted to presidents, they only to men, that's going to change also. They're busy men. Someone else cooks their food for them. Someone else drives their car. They bring in an expert on science for scientific problems. They bring in an expert on the military for military problems. Why shouldn't they bring in an expert wordsmith when they have a words problem and are simply too busy to do it all of themselves? So why uh, presidents uh, feel that they must conceal the fact they have speech writers even using teleprompters to conceal the fact that they're reading the text, I think uh, makes very little sense and adds to this uh, unfortunate uh, prejudice that exists in some quarters against speech writers, as though they were uh, somehow uh, shadowy figures behind the scenes. My book, my book, Counselor, is subtitled A Life at the Edge of History. I hope I'm not antagonizing my publisher by revealing that they originally wanted it to be called A Life in the Shadows of Power. I said, first of all, I wasn't in the shadows. That sounds somehow sinister. <laughs> 
secondly, I tried to make one read the book. I said, did not go to church. I did not exercise power. I was an assistant. I was an advisor. I knew the difference between my role and the role of the President of the United States. And the speeches on which I worked and in which I take pride represented the President's decisions, the President's policy, the President's values, which I'm proud to say I share. So in some ways it's uh, easy to write a speech. It was easy for me to write speeches for John F. Kennedy because we served together for 11 years and found that uh, our values and our ideals coincided, that we had both been 